Good evening and welcome to the Natural History Institute speaker series. I'm Bob Ellis and I'm going to be the host tonight. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First of all, the bathroom and water fountain are at the base of those stairs. However, you have to walk around that way to get there. And our art gallery is featuring Adele Saran's exhibition, Art, Nature, and Spirit. And it'll be open after the presentation tonight. And uh, I encourage you to go in and see that. And I would be remiss if I didn't tell you about two very exciting field experiences that beautifully mix art and natural history that we have coming up. On Saturday, September the 24th, Leanne Woolery will take you into the field. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. <laughs> and share her approach to using art as both a way of deepening one's understanding of nature and a mechanism for conducting citizen science or community science. And then on October the 1st, <laughs> we are headed to the San Francisco Peaks Heart Prairie, where Gwen Waring will conduct a plein air painting session. And for those of you who do not know Gwen, she literally wrote the book on the natural history of the San Francisco Peaks, and she's quite an accomplished artist. Information about those events are available in the lobby and on our website, and the wonderful Jesse Rack, who just walked across the, the room, our program director. You could also talk to her tonight to get registered for those events. And I have another announcement that Nikki Check is going to make for us tonight. Nikki's our development director. And like all nonprofits, charities, 5013Cs, we are 501C3. We are very interested and appreciative of your support. And if you want to continue seeing programming like this and all the other things we do, we uh, definitely would encourage you to chat with Nikki. So my pitch tonight is a soft one. Uh, I've been the development director here for one month now, um, but my pitch to you tonight is not for NHI, but rather for the Walnut Creek Center for Education and Research. Uh, if you've ever been out to the Juniper Mesa hiking trail, right across the street is a very quaint and historic uh, former Forest Service ranger station that was founded in 1908. And they are currently, it's, a, it's currently um, kind of managed through a partnership with Prescott College, NAU, the Arboretum. Ed Boyer here is uh, the main contact, and they are looking for more visitors. It's a pretty easy ask, um, both daytime and overnight. Uh, there's a small fee for overnight uh, stays, and it's just an incredible place full of biodiversity. There's riparian area. There's big cottonwoods. There's research actively going on. It's a great spot, and if you're interested in taking a group or individuals out there, talk more with Ed. You want to raise your ha hand, Ed? Great. All right. Thank you all, and enjoy this evening's program. Oh, we have a question. So it's it's right on Walnut Creek. It's actually at a confluence where, Walnut, where Apache and Walnut, yeah, right Apache and Walnut it's Creek. It's gorgeous. I just visited not too long ago, and it's definitely an underutilized resource, and we want to change that. So. Thank you. Peregrine Book Company is here for sales for uh, Lisa's books here tonight. So if you're interested in one of the books, right. <laughs> yeah, do that. <laughs> All right, so Pinion and Juniper Woodlands occupy 70,000 square miles of western U.S. Their ecological, cultural, and economic importance cannot be underestimated. As climate crisis becomes more and more evident, you must ask, who 
has their eyes on the pinyon juniper woodlands. Who among us knows their natural history? And who knows their current status and trend? Well, if you happen to have guessed Dr. Lisa Floyd Hanna, then you would be right. Lisa has over 40 years of research level engagement with this fascinating, beautiful, and complex biotic community. And lucky for us, she's here to share what she knows with us tonight. Lisa earned her MS in botany at the University of Hawaii and her PhD in ecology from the University of Colorado. Her research has focused on developing the fire histories in pinyon juniper woodlands and other forest systems of southwest Colorado and the Mogollon Highlands. Lisa is emeritus faculty at Prescott College and the science director here at the Natural History Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lisa Floyd Hanna. was one of infilling and expansion, and people even applied the word invasion. The Kenyan and Juniper um, were getting into, and it's been a dynamic interface um, ever since, 10,000 years ago. However, the story now, the 21st century, is a completely different picture. We're now seeing contraction. We're seeing. <laughs> Sorry, so we use sure. the wire. We use the lead hero on the live stream. Oh, if that's okay. That's fine. Sorry, excuse me. You just put it on. And then it will work. Okay. We should have done that before. Okay. <laughs> um, but the story now is really uh, one of contraction and thinning. And so um, I was just at a meeting, for example, uh, in Flagstaff yesterday, where there were actually two huge sessions on pinion juniper where everybody was concerned about it. And, and it sort of warms my heart because for years, everyone's just wanted to chop it down. Um, but uh, it, it's in crisis like every other uh, ecosystem. So I think it's a really good time to talk about old growth stands because they are unique, persistent, and um, I think there's a lot of characteristics of them that people don't know. So. I did start my PhD here in Prescott on uh, Mingus Mountain. It was one of my many sites. So just a little personal story here, except I can't get this thing to work. How do I do this? <laughs> Forward. Do I have to do this? I'll do this. OK. You got it? Huh? Well, no, I'm just going to use this. You can do this, yeah. <laughs> Oh, it was not on. Sorry. I'm not big on technology, let me tell you. OK, um, I want to acknowledge all my collaborators, Dave Hanna, who's here, Bill Rami at CSU. We've done all this work together. And many, many, many Prescott College students over the years have been involved um, in this research. And Dustin Hanna, my son, there. So my story with Pinion uh, starts in 1979. I lived in my yellow Volkswagen, and I traveled all over the, the southwest and northern Mexico. And these are some of my sites. What's happening? Just see. There's a Tom Fleshner is interfering with my. <laughs> I don't know. Hit the what? Where's the later button? You, could you stay over here I'll just and fix this? <laughs> ah. <laughs> That's 
Great. Uh, now we have to go back. Okay. Um, so, so at that point, I was really interested in a spectrum of uh, pinion juniper stands that ranged from northern Colorado down into the highlands of Mexico and looking at their demography. And at that point, I started to really fall in love with them. I started aging them. I aged hundreds of trees. I counted cones. Every cone, male cones, they're very small. Um, I counted seedlings. I had a tree, one tree core, and I went all over the southwest. It was such a great time to just become familiar uh, with this tree. And I realized in doing that that a couple of things. One, they were super, super old, which was not what most people had thought. Um, and they were really, really tough. So they're on the edge, really, of forested ecosystems. So below that, we have chaparral, we have desert, um, but we have these huge pinions as well. So if you, afterwards, you might want to look at this one. This, how old do you think this diameter pinion might be? 150, that's good. Sometimes people say 35, I just go, oh. No, but this one actually has an origin date of 1643. So they are very slow growing. Different habitats, of course, they grow at different rates. So what I'd like to do, that introduction, just tell you um, a few things about pinion juniper, and we can, we can talk. And, um, but I want to talk about the old growth and why I think they're valuable, and maybe you'll have other insights into that. Then I'd like to describe some variation in old growth. I want to go to the north edge of the distribution, kind of the middle, and then down to the south edge of the distribution. And then finally, talk about future projections um, briefly. In the end, I'm going to try to keep this to you know, 40, 45 minutes, so we have some time to talk. Um, so old growth, you know, when we think of old growth, we think of, you know, the Pacific Northwest, big giant trees, um, and there's lots of different definitions uh, you can see from these studies, but they usually come in three categories. There are structural definitions, dynamic definitions, and biogeochemical ones. So let's look briefly at how those apply to pinion juniper. So pinion juniper, um, in terms of structure, we expect to have an inverse J-shaped distribution. That means lots of seedlings and few um, older ones. We also might get a multimodal kind of distribution. Secondly, we expect to have some of the oldest trees, okay, at least a few of the, the maximum age for the species. The maximum age for pinion, this tree here is 910 years old. And um, junipers can get older, but they're very hard to cross date. They're very hard to age uh, accurately. So we kind of go with the pinion because they are easy to age and then assume a stand is older because it'll have older junipers in it. And then thirdly, uh, or thirdly um, the mean age of a lot of the trees, the dominant trees, should be about half that. So we expect these stands to be about 450 years old. And then finally, a lot of stuff on the ground, coarse woody debris. In terms of dynamics, um, the fire history of pinion juniper is not the same as the fire history of the ponderosa pines. So ponderosa pines have very frequent uh, fire cycles. You want to go in and burn them to um, have a natural kind of dynamic. This is a very different dynamic, and it's a stand replacing system that takes a long time, maybe 400 years, maybe longer, before we expect an area to reburn. And that makes sense if the trees can get to be 900 years old, right? In terms of the biogeochemistry, it's just so fascinating. I don't have time, or I'm actually not really an expert in that um, to talk about tonight, but I just want to draw your attention to how complex everything is under the ground 
for pinions. So we have all, many of our shrubs are actinorhizal. They have nitrogen-fixing bacteria in them. They're pumping nitrogen into the system and pinions accepting that, pinions and juniper are utilizing that. Biotic crusts are notorious for providing all sorts of resources to the whole ecosystem, which the trees certainly benefit. And finally, there's a whole host of ectomycorrhizae and dark septate mycorrhizae underneath the ground that are connecting the roots of pinions to each other, pinions to juniper, grasses to pinion. We don't know much about it yet, but that, that's a super exciting um, area of research. I heard a fabulous talk on it yesterday. Okay, so I guess who cares? So old growth is something which I think, I think we in this room probably do very much care about. But if we think about like why do we? Well, certainly because they're old. And if you're going to live that long, you're taking up a lot of carbon. You're providing habitat for a lot of different animals and um, other plants. Um, but also, there's, trees mitigate warming. So these huge trees are really good for mitigating the effects of climate change and so on. So my friend Bill Baker recently, um, this is a quote from a paper he wrote where he's talking about how it would be fabulous if management could think about old growth as a goal for restoration. So keep the old stands and keep a whole array of ages so there will be old stands coming into the picture in the future. It's a great paper. Other people talk about the biodiversity. So for example, um, in Colorado, there, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program has suggested that pinyon juniper holds a lot of the threatened species in the state. Even though it's only 10% of the area, it has over a third of the, um, has a third of the most threatened plants, for example. And we know, and we'll see in the uh, subsequent slides, that these old stands have very high biodiversity. So what I want to do is, is look at three stands tonight. Dinosaur National Park is at the northern end of the Pinus edulis distribution. There's nine kinds of pinion. And I'm only talking about Pinus edulis tonight. Mesa Verde National Park is cut in the middle. And then we have our pinions down here in the Mogollon Rim. So I'd like to focus more on ours than the others, of course. But uh, we'll start in the north. So these northern stands are, have some of the oldest pinions I've ever seen in my life. The biggest pinions, that's Dave and I trying to get our arms around it. They're just, they, they're towering over you. They're so beautiful. And one of the reasons why they've been able to get so old is there's a lot of barriers to fire. So there's canyons and slick rock. And if you haven't been up to Dinosaur National Monument, I suggest you go. It's fantastic. So clearly, trees approach the maximum age. In fact, they are the maximum age that I know of for the species. Um, they'll die in place. And then ultimately, they'll fall over and produce that coarse woody debris. My students named this one place Ridge of the Giants because all the trees were so huge. And uh, this stand dates to 1200. And um, then you can see there were bursts of uh, establishment since that time. But this stand is it, at that northern edge has been very, very healthy um, throughout this time. And, there's been a lot of work done up there on a midden, a pack ride midden, and that midden suggests that pinions only got to this area in 1200. So that means these are the original pioneers, and they're still persisting and being really good. They're really great trees. And then they fall, and there's lots of coarse woody debris. It's not a real easy place to navigate because you're walking over these big trees all over. Lots of seedlings. This is the classic inverse J. 
We have some old guys, four or 500, maybe older, but lots and lots of seedlings and saplings. That suggests a, a long-standing old growth kind of situation. Dinosaurs super rich in biodiversity, and a lot of that diversity is in the pinion. So we have crusts, we have birds, we have um, probably more than half of the 650 vascular plants are in the pinion juniper zone. So they're fabulous, they're just fabulous. One of the cool things, I think, about having these super old trees is that they can give you some insight into ecological and climatic parameters. So Dustin Hanna here um, was able to show, after coring lots and lots of these trees and looking at their patterns of growth against climatic data, that pinions respond differently to climate over time. So young trees are, are, have fairly low what is called mean sensitivity their sensitivity or perception of the environment. Then they get to be about 200, 250, they kind of level off, then after 700 years, it drops precipitously again. And, and that has implications for the climate now. So with our mega drought, uh, dry, hot temperatures, we're expecting trouble in, in the uh, super old trees, and that is in fact what we're seeing. But this stand up until now has been pretty healthy, whereas there have been beetles in the rest of the distribution. That north edge has kind of been exempt, um, haven't had many beetles, but they have had um, more frequent wildfires. So the fire cycle here is 600 years, and now those fires are starting to get a little more frequent. Um, and Unfortunately, then they have been invaded by cheatgrass and other novel vegetation types. So they, they're essentially lost um, from the landscape. They can't really regenerate as pinion juniper with all that cheatgrass in there. So that's the big threat to that stand. Okay then. That's on the north edge, you know, and edges, just let me say for a minute, edges are of concern to ecologists because sometimes they're harbingers of what might come to the middle part, right? So if we, if we focus on the north edge and we focus on the south edge, we might see how the whole stand is going to be. So they, we typically think they're a little more stressed than other um, stands. So now we're moving from the edge right smack in the middle, Mesa Verde National Park, where I spent 25 years uh, working on the pinions there. And this book um, is a culmination of what a, a whole lot of naturalists uh, think of the old growth in Mesa Verde. And here, though, the pinions only reach 500 years. I did this work first, so I thought these were really old. Then we went to dinosaur, and we were like, whoa, you know, they're kind of young down there in Mesa Verde. Yeah. Maybe 500. Most of the stands are, date about 400 years, so it's a 400 year fire cycle. One expects the size of Mesa Verde to reburn every 400 or so years. But all those characteristics are there. We have junipers, we got inverse J, we got lots of seedlings. And these stands, if you look at the historic pictures, have looked like that for a long time, at least uh, till early 1900s. So this, this is kind of concerning because we see this inverse J shape over here, a stand in 1984. But if you look at it in 2003, it's flatter. And that suggests that we're not getting seedlings and saplings coming in. A couple of reasons for that. Pinions in this area mast. Do you know what masting is? They, it's producing big quantities of seed. So cones, there'll be cones all over the plant. And oaks do it too here. Like you'll have a great year and then the next year you don't have any. You know, so it's, it's this phenomenon of kind of flooding the market um, 
so that birds and mammals and all can eat their fill but not eat them all, right? So that's one of the hypotheses of why it occurs. So we have not seen masting much in the last 20 years. And so we're not getting much recruitment um, into them. And I'll tell you some other reasons for that lack of recruitment in a minute. So Mesa Verde, though, is gorgeous, high biodiversity, 200 more uh, forbs in the old, these are in the old growth uh, pinion juniper. We have endemics, the Mesa Verde stick seed and stragulus schmoli only occur on Mesa Verde, right, in the pinion juniper. It's just great. And then we have some other old growth obligates before and after fire. That's wild tobacco that only comes in after fire. Lots of grasses, lots of lichens, lots of mosses. So very rich biodiversity. And the reason I know this is that my colleague, um, Marilyn Collier, was the resource manager at Mesa Verde for 60 years. She started as an archaeologist on one of the projects. She was just fantastic. And we all knew she was going to retire one of those days, and she had file cabinets full of data, and it was just amazing. So I encouraged her, and together we wrote this book. It's, it's a little older, but it's still very relevant. It covers each um, taxa, like we would pull together people who knew about the biotic crust, people who knew about the uh, insects, um, and so on, and just tried to say how incredible it was, because at that point, we were still kind of fighting the pinion and juniper are horrible kind of phenomenon that's out there, you know. There's at least 115 birds there that live part of their life cycle in the pinion juniper, and those are some of my favorites, but there's lots of them. But I'd like to bring your attention to the pinion jay. The pinion jay is kind of notorious for its relationship with pinion. So it actually collects, the cones open, it sees those, it picks the seeds out, it caches them. So on a masting year, this is great because they can cache way more than they'll ever eat. They're very busy, they have a sublingual pouch, they can take all sorts of seeds with them supposedly 250 can be in there, move them around. And the thing that they do, which is so phenomenal for the pinions, is they plant them in the best sites. So they plant them under a rock, under a log, under a nurse plant, because pinions can't do it in the open. So if the seeds that just fall out of the tree in the open, that won't, won't survive at all. So the pinion jay is like a, a very important uh, friend to the pinions and vice versa. So the gonads of the pinion jay actually develop if they see the green cones. It takes two and a half years to develop a green cone. So they come in, they see that, they go, oh, there's going to be a good crop for my babies. And then they, their gonads actually respond. Phenomenal. Um, and they, they are now known to forage nest. What else do birds do, Carl? They forage, they <laughs> nest, they cache. There's one other thing. But they do it all in different uh, types of pinion juniper woodlands. But they love that old growth structure. So the thing that's kind of startling is that this very abundant bird is now threatened. Um, and it's gotten listed in New Mexico, in Arizona. We were having a discussion yesterday about this. And um, apparently, they used to be more abundant here. But now, as long as I've lived here, I, I have not seen these big flocks of pinion jays. Um, so it's, um, it's a worry. And it is actually driving the Forest Service to preserve the old growth stands in New Mexico. So with Defenders of Wildlife and other groups are really on this, trying to uh, keep the old growth to help with the um, pinion jays. And definitely the treatments that are used 
to thin the forests are very detrimental to the pinyon jays. So that'll be a great angle um, for preservation of the old growth. <laughs> okay. Um, so I mentioned this already, that they mast these large crops can put out so many seeds, and then those seeds um, will be put under nurse plants. That turns out, as we'll see in a minute, is really important for our area here. We have the best nurse plants. So at May Severity, um, it, I mentioned, I think, that fire cycle's about 400 years. It takes 400 years to reburn that study area. Um, but the recent fires have been much more, we had a fire in 1989, 1996, 2000, 2002, 2003, and it's just been too soon. So while the character of the, the fires are what they should be, they're just too, um, too frequent. And then, um, but here's a 1934 fire. It was a big one. So there always have been fires. It's not like fire should not be occurring, stem replacing fires should not be occurring in those ecosystems. This was one of the, one of the biggest. Um, but that fire, the 1996 fire, was the first time we began to see cheatgrass come in after fire. And so we at Mesa Verde actually seeded it, aerial seeded with uh, native grasses, kind of targeted. Um, which may or may not have been a good thing for the native vegetation, but we were trying to keep the cheatgrass out. And, and it's helped, but it hasn't prevented this. So cheatgrass, <clears throat> as you know from here, I mean, it is a flammable, flashy fuel. And, and if there's lightning, it lights and it spreads. And if it's a 400-year fire cycle, and you start getting these repeated fires with cheatgrass, then you have immediately shifted to a different kind of fire cycle. And, and the seedlings, which may have taken decades to get in there anyway, um, aren't coming. Yeah, they're not coming back. So these systems are, are kind of lost to us once they burn. Another threat that they have um, is the pinion nips. And we here have not had this that badly, but in, um, on the Colorado Plateau, we uh, lost, May Severity, we lost a third of the trees, but around Santa Fe, they lost 90% of them in 2003. And it continues to now. It is a beetle. Yeah. It's a, it's a beetle that bores into the trees and then um, calls in all its friends using its terpenes, um, uses the resin from the tree to become a pheromone, and then they aggregate on the tree. They get under the bark and essentially girdle it. Yeah. What's the name of the beetle? This one is called the pinion engraver beetle, Ips confusus. But there are other beetles. Dendroctinus is the one we had here. You remember 2000 and what year was when we really lost all the ponderosas? Was it 2000? 2002, yeah. Um, so that is Dendroctinus. That opinion also um, is affected by Dendroctinus. Dendroctinus ponderosi. So there's a lot of beetles. And in the book, you'll see there's 10,000 insects in the pinyon juniper forest. So they have been living in that kind, or more, more than 10,000, but many, many, many beetles. OK, so leaving the middle, May Severity, then we come to the best, the Mogollon Highlands. Um, here at the Institute, we are focusing on this region um, as our research area and trying to characterize the biodiversity of plants, animals. We have um, a current butterfly study. We have had a snake study. So looking to, to verify what we think is true and that this is a, ve a very, very rich 
area of high biodiversity because it has plants coming from the south, the east and the west, from the Rocky Mountains, so it's kind of this fabulous ecotone, really, of uh, plants and snakes. So, so far is what we know. <laughs> um, so the pinion in this area is a different pinion. It's Pinus edulis variety phallus. It's got one and two needles and looks kind of thin growth compared to the regular edulis, which is kind of more robust uh, looking. And it is associated with alligator juniper. So the other stands that I was talking about don't have alligator juniper. And alligator just, you know, hits right about in the Mogollon Highlands, doesn't get much further. There's a few of them on Flagstaff, but. Um, so that's one of those species. It's a southern one that stops here. And, and I think that's really different, um, making the whole ecosystem different. So we have three kinds of junipers here, and they behave a little differently. This was my, one of my stands in 1980 on Mingus Mountain. These are slides that have been scanned <laughs> with not particularly good scanners. So, but I kind of like this historic look at it, you know? And um, these stands are much younger, even though they're the oldest ones here. The old growth here is probably 300 years versus 450 or 500 may severity and 900 up on the north end. And there's some reasons I think we could talk about that. Um, for that one is that it is a different variety. It's just a slightly different um, accumulation of genes. So, but we get um, some really lovely um, stands. These are out towards Juniper Mesa that we were just talking about, Fair Oaks. You can get really uh, dense, beautiful stands, and associated with the alligator juniper. And then they integrate with the chaparral. So the chaparral is one of our greatest gifts here because we have at least 17 shrub, perennial shrub species. The other pinion stands probably only have a few, one, and the main one is uh, Gamble's Oak in those stands I was showing you before. So we just have a completely different kind of association here, one that's very rich in nurse plants, I mean, from the pinion's perspective, right? Uh, look at those, they're just gorgeous. A lot of them, the two on the bottom, are both um, actinorhizal, nitrogen fixing. So these are very rich environments where you have mountain mahogany or where you have Apache plume. Um, those are very, very rich in terms of nitrogen, super good for seedling establishment, but the others are incredible nurse plants. So it's just more likely that those seedlings are gonna establish under these shrubs, and they do and we have more seedlings here than anywhere else I've ever seen. Yeah. There was a lot of reproduction in 1980 here. I might have even called it masting. I didn't get that the trees here don't really mast at that time. I had to move down here and live here to really see. They, they produce cones, some cones almost every year. Some trees do in the population. So it's very, it's different. And the net effect of it here is that there's lots of those little seedlings. So I wanted you to see those seedlings so that you can look for them when you're out hiking. Then the other thing is who's planting them? Because if the pinion jays aren't really that prevalent here anymore, I'm sure there are some, but um, certainly not these huge flocks of 200, 300 birds that are where we live in Durango. I mean, we live with a flock of pinion jays. I mean, they just, they're the squawkiest. They come in every day and say hello. And they're, you know, but the, I, I never see that here. So we're thinking scrub jays, maybe other corvids. So I would love it if you would all look for that when you're out hiking. Because we're, I really don't know who's caching, but I know they're doing a good job. 
because it's very effective. Here's a stand uh, from 2007. Look at all the seedlings, you know, and, but it only goes to about 300 years old. So it's, it's a different uh, kind of phenomenon, but uh, nonetheless has all the old growth characteristics. The other thing that's weird about here is where the stem replacing fires on the Colorado Plateau are huge. They could be square miles, square hectares anyway. Um, here they're tiny. So what you have is a lot of evidence of fire when you're out hiking. May severity, you can hike for four days and never see a piece of charred wood except in these recent fires. So this is a, unusual. It's more of a patchy stand replacing fire. And I think it's part, uh, in part because of the shrubs. So there's different kinds of fuels and different kinds of um, start, fire starts and just a different pattern. But we have big fires. We have big stand replacing fires. Most of you probably remember this one. Might have been in your backyard <laughs> uh, on Granite Mountain. So it was a, a pretty cool pinyon juniper fire, and we did follow it um, for a number of years after. And the old stands on the north side of Granite Mountain are the ones that now have the highest biodiversity, for sure, of Forbes and everything. How am I doing on time, Dave? You're supposed to be my timekeeper. Oh, I have five more minutes, is what you tell me. Okay, speed it up. Current conditions, um, right now, there's a startling thing going on in the Southwest is junipers are dying. And junipers have always been considered way more hardy than pinions. Um, and we have them dying all over the place. Have you driven up to flag lately on both sides of the road? It's just like, whoa, what is going on? And it isn't the beetle and it isn't anything that we're real clear about. Um, but it began in 2021 and it continues. It's, they're still dying. But the interesting thing, I think, from our perspective is that um, the alligator's dying here. So these are on Thumb Butte. Um, and my model here, Edie, was <laughs> showing us that there was a little green piece re-sprouting. So it, alligator juniper is different from the other junipers in that it sprouts after fire and after it looks like it's all dead. So now the question is, and keep your eyes open for this in the upcoming years, are they going to make it? Like, are these few branches going to actually um, keep that genetic individual. Um, I've seen this re-sprouting in about 30% is my guess of those, but um, it's, it's interesting. See, there's the little sprout. So you can have a big old tree and then you just have the little sprouts the next year. And then the, these are beetles over here on the right. And that, that is probably not what's killing most of them. It's not clear what they are, but that is definitely beetles, those galleries. So I don't know. I don't know what's happening with these junipers, but that's one thing that we really want to find out. There's some sprouting at the bottom, sprouting at the top. The pinions are faring a little better, but we are seeing a lot of fading in pinions. Pinions have a scale insect that's uh, Matsococcus, which is here and not in a lot of other stands. It's kind of a Mogollon Highlands thing. And it makes the trees look kind of puny like that, but if you get in there in the spring and take their eggs away from the bottom of the tree, bingo, you got a beautiful tree coming back. So they're not dead, but they're stressed. So something else might come kill them. Well, again, remains to be seen. Okay, so to kind of summarize, I think what we have here is not only a, a more uh, rich ecosystem in terms of all the perennial shrubs, but we also have this pinion that was hybrid origin, right? It has monophyla genes, it has edulous genes. So it is, hybrids are sometimes a little more resilient um, to environmental change. They, they have a mix of genes. And so 
I'm thinking about hybrids. And there's another place, another pocket I found in New Mexico where there's two and three needled pinions. So they have Symbroides genes coming in from Mexico and they have edulous genes. And I think these hybrid stands might be kind of, could be very important to us in the long run because we're hoping we'll maintain pinion juniper. Um, I, I hope we'll maintain pinion juniper in the landscape. This is a really cool pinion, and it's also in the Mogollon Highlands. It's further south in the New Mexico part. It's, pine, it's called border pine, pinus discolor. You could see the, the needles have two colors. The, there's all these stomata that give that white look. And, and that, those kinds of habitats are really cool. This is in the Gila area. So, um, that's another one that uh, we are lucky to have here, um, not right here in Prescott, but in the Mogollon Highlands. And then we also have Mexican three-needle pinion that's coming up from Mexico isolated stands. So we really, we have a lot of different kinds of pinions. Okay, then just to summarize here, I think old growth is valuable in any species. Um, but of course, my favorite is pinion and juniper. But you know, they maintain all this biodiversity, and they are just such important museums, really, of what the ecosystem uh, should be. However, they are now being threatened by the larger fires, the invasive species, and the insects. But I'd like to propose this idea that the Mogollon Highlands may be kind of a safe site uh, for pinions in the future. So, of course, you know, after the last, the Wisconsin glaciation, there weren't any pinions here. And then they all marched back up, and they made it up there to dinosaur. Um, they move around, right? Maybe this is a place where, if they can be maintained, that they'll actually be able to provide pinion juniper, um, alligator juniper habitats in the future. So I, I'm, I'm thinking this area is a little more resilient to climate change than the other sites that I've studied. But that's just a hypothesis, but it, it is based on looking at these stands for a long time. And I guess that is it. Okay. Turn this off. Yes. Juniper habitat that occurs down in Walnut Grove. Yes. So you need to do dragon elephants, just huge, huge in this little pocket. Yeah, I think I know where you're talking about. Um, and they and we did age them. And there are some of the oldest. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah. Uh huh. Good. Is there any evidence that the pinions of these universe are starting to spread in other states as climate conditions start to change? Or are they so like, localized in this area that there's not really much of a chance of that? Yeah, well, as Bob said in his introduction, pinion and juniper is very widespread, but there are eight pinions across that landscape. The whole Great Basin is a different pinion, Pinus monophylla. Um, so what we're seeing not so much is spreading out into other states, but maybe spreading a little higher in elevation as the Ponderosa pinion chaparral interface here, for example, we might start to see them jumping up. So there's a lot of speculation that that's going to happen. Yeah. I love your optimism. <laughs> I don't feel it, however. But I, know, I love I know. it. I love it. Um, the age difference is, is fascinating to me. The 300 years here and then up to 900. Yeah. What's that about? Do we have any idea? Well, part of it is, the, is this variety is just a, you know, a little different, the variety phallix. And I think part of it is. The fire cycles different, shorter, um, so they do get wiped out more before, but in smaller patches. And thirdly, 
there may be older stands out there that I haven't been able to core, you know? Because we really have never been funded to do the fire history of this area. It's always been my students and I going out, uh, doing that. Whereas at Mesa Verde, we were very well funded and at Dinosaur we were. So I just had a conversation yesterday um, with a colleague who has grants and money. And uh, I said, you know, this is what we should be doing. And he said, yeah, we should be doing that. So hopefully I'm going to, I really would like to do a really good full-blown fire history here and see if there might be older stands like that that might push that age up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you talked about the enemies of the opinion, uh, Juniper. Um, you didn't mention the chain that's taken place and, mm -hmm. and how big of an impact that has uh, out there siding along the uh, Upper Verde River, there's just acres and acres and acres mm -hmm. where they've just gone through and chained and brought down the Pinion Junipers. Yeah. Uh, is, is that a big threat? And, and part of the rationale is, well, we're saving the water because Pinion Junipers uh, transfer mm -hmm. all of our water, mm -hmm. so we're really going to feed the aquifer more. Do you have thoughts about uh, that kind oh, of yeah, argument? Oh, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> 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 but yesterday at yeah. this meeting, um, my thoughts were verified. Um, first, there was a, a really great paper that looked at tree removal and the effect on the uh, water situation, and it's exactly the opposite. There's, it's, all, it's also been published. Trees bring water in, right? They, may, they, they love water. Grasses are like this high, you know, water can go right through and go somewhere else. But um, they, trees actually keep a much wetter soil environment. Even though they demand a lot, they also, in fact, they were talking about this in another, in, with suaros, that suaros bring that water in, you know, and we always talk about how they expand. Well, now they're seeing that they actually bring that water down and push it out into the uh, root system and create a much wetter soil situation throughout those areas. So chaining, ha that's what I was saying in the beginning, you know, that people didn't want pinion and juniper. Rain, it, it destroys a range, and range was the primary, and is the primary goal for many management activities. But the state of Utah, I mean, they, they chained so much pinion and juniper. I mean, this pales in comparison to what's in the north. And the thing about the chains um, is they miss all the seedlings, you know. So they take out the big ones, but the chain's too high. And so um, there, there's actually was a talk today that I missed um, where a colleague of mine from the Ecological Restoration Institute was going to do that kind of historic perspective um, on effects of chaining. So hopefully we can get him down here to do that. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Just for local observation since the late 80s, I haven't seen much regeneration of pinion due to scale. And that started pretty much around Copper Basin, moved mm -hmm. through Hacienda, and is gradually moving north. It hasn't made its way out to Williamson Valley. Everybody the scale is actually yeah. mm -hmm. you know, It's just a, a local pinion. A uh, problem. The other um, presentation, I've heard presentations about um, pre colonial and, and the Kaiba Plateau, and we talked about Ash Fork, Fork in that region. And when they came out here to establish Fort Whipple, they had a lot of historic photographs uh -huh. uh, you know, taken when they, the soldiers came out here, and then showing about the quote invasion. Uh, uh, Juniper, you know, from Kaibet. Right. And I know there's been some efforts to take that out. They cleared uh, uh, Juniper along the highway. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So what do, you, what do you think about that? Well, are you familiar with Harley Shaw, who was uh, with Arizona Game Fish here? He, he produced a really uh, great 
uh, historic photo comparison and, and um, text from the Whipple expeditions, you know, and, and really, you ought to look at that. It's, I'm trying to think, of, it's got a great name, Plenty of Wood something. But his general conclusion is there has not been a lot of invasion. There's been a lot of infilling in areas that might have had, and that's what you'd expect, right? There's an ebb and flow at any ecotone. Um, so certainly, if you take a photo at a moment in time, it could be more grass, or another moment in time, it could be more juniper or pinyon. Um, so I think that in those ecotonal areas, there has been an interesting ebb and flow. If it burns frequently, then the, it'll favor the grass, because the junipers and pinyons are fire sensitive, except alligator juniper which will re-sprout, so that's a different one. Um, so I, I feel like both sides are right in a way, um, but I don't think we should manage for an ecosystem that we want in that second. Like, we want to have only juniper here, or we only want, we want to reinstate a dynamic process so the ebb and flow might actually exist there. And that's what I think is going to keep the water table um, the way it should be. But I don't have a lot of data to support that. <laughs> My understanding that PJ forest, particularly juniper, have been expanding greatly in the grasslands because of black suppression of grass fire to keep them up. Is that wrong? There, there are some cases where that could be true. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a general case because um, there is a pinyon savanna, a true pinyon savanna in New Mexico, for example, where the fire cycle is more like 30 years. Um, Ellis Margolis is who did that work. Um, and so there are places where more frequent fire will kind of push the pinyon and juniper back, and then when there's less fire, you'll get uh, them moving out. Definitely that, that is true. Nasty cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the three different grows. Are they, when the cycle comes about, is it independent in the grows or is it occurring at all three grows at the same time? Everybody's nasty at the same at time. time. Yeah, that's the thing. So it, it's the most interesting thing. So little teeny, well, that you don't reproduce till you're about that big, but you know, small trees, huge trees, they're all doing this at the same time. Then the next year, eh, we're not going to do it anymore, right? And so we always had thought, now, the common thought was that they were communicating by terpenes, right? And there was an early paper in the late 70s by a guy named Frank Forsella, and he showed that that was associated with cold temperatures two years before. So the trees somehow were triggered by these cold temperatures when they set their cones, because it's a two-year cycle. And so that was kind of the common wisdom. But now, Kitty Gearing at NAU and other people are really honing in on these mycorrhizae. So they are really communicating underneath there. And I cannot believe that a lot of that communication isn't also happening underneath the ground. But I'm glad you asked that question, because yeah, it's all ages. Yeah, it's really cool. All right, I know it's late, and everyone needs to go to sleep. All right, well, I think Lisa's going to hang out here for a little bit, answer okay. some questions. We'll turn the lights on in the gallery. You can go in there and visit. And think about one of her books. <laughs> Join me in thank her. And